I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great and, as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The Barnum Museum has a unique treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to millions of ordinary people, as well as royalty and high society. These letters offer a unique glimpse into the life of P.T. Barnum as a husband, father, mentor, and entrepreneur. Join us as we travel back in time and learn about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum through his own words. If you enjoy this episode, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our podcast to help our rankings and support the Barnum Museum. And now, on with the show. Instructive Entertainments, Early 19th Century Panoramas Often, there is no substitute for seeing an actual museum artifact from the past instead of its digital surrogate, especially if the artifact is a large-scale one. Even the finest quality images on a regular computer screen can't adequately convey the feeling one has when in the presence of something that is really big. That said, seeing the real thing along with interpretive digital media combines the best of both worlds, since digital images offer their own advantages, like revealing greater detail than we ordinarily see. For example, our curator Adrian St. Pierre recently visited such an exhibition and wanted to share some of that experience since it relates to a topic that has come up in several of P.T. Barnum's copybook letters we've been exploring. Barnum often mentioned panoramas in his letters, which is not too surprising since static and moving panoramas were a very popular form of entertainment in Barnum's day. The static versions were typically mounted inside round structures, rotundas, which later came to be called cycloramas, whereas the moving versions were shown in theaters or similar kinds of spaces. Barnum was interested in purchasing or renting moving panoramas to show in his lecture hall, which was the theater space in the American Museum. So when Adrian learned that an actual 1840s panorama was on exhibit at Mystic Seaport Museum in Connecticut, she jumped at the opportunity to go and see it. She wanted to get a feel for an experience that people in the past enjoyed, and thereby add to her understanding of what Barnum was writing about. Panoramas were, after all, among the forms of instructive entertainment that he desired to offer his museum visitors, which is to say he was seeking attractions that were simultaneously awesome and educational and would appeal to the general public. The Whaling Voyage panorama that was exhibited for several months at Mystic Seaport is a rarity to be sure, since the usable life of an 18th or 19th century moving panorama was shortened by constant travel from place to place, each time being installed and deinstalled, unspooled and respooled multiple times, then packed up and transported again, and not by professional art handlers. Under those conditions, the painted cloth inevitably became tattered and worn, and as Barnum himself noted in a letter of September 11, 1845, I have seen the old panorama of Napoleon's funeral. It was exhibiting at the races, but it is worn out. Eventually, as new forms of visual entertainment came along, panoramas sitting forgotten in storage were relegated to rubbish heaps or stowed in derelict places that practically ensured their ruin. So there aren't many around, at least not the early ones. The story of this 1848 panorama depicting a three-year whaling voyage is not only a fascinating one in terms of how it was made, but also a tale of great luck. Most of it survived though one section went missing 100 years ago, and one of the original five spools is gone. The panorama is owned by the New Bedford Whaling Museum in Massachusetts, and thanks to the talents of professional conservators, digitization wizards, and specialist historians, it has been brought to life once again. 
If you didn't have an opportunity to see it at Mystic Seaport or at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, you can learn about the exhibition titled Spectacle in Motion and see videos on their websites, which are linked in the show notes. Or you can enjoy the voyage via a digital story map created by Michael Lapides and Christina Sewell, which is also linked in the show notes. The panorama is eight and a half feet tall, the height of a typical home ceiling. And since it was created as a moving spectacle, its length is quite impressive, 1,275 feet, or 388.62 meters long. It is divided into four sections, each one wrapped around its own giant spool. These are new custom-made spools. Because of the painted fabric's delicate condition due to its age, it couldn't be displayed as it was originally, in motion, nor can it be shown upright. So, to address those issues, Mystic Seaport created a display structure in which two huge spools flanked a 30-foot span that supported the painted cloth at an angle. One spool was the take-up spool. Every three weeks, expert museum staff rolled the panorama to the next 30-foot segment, and when it reached the end, they changed to the next spool. Also, for this exhibition, they constructed a mini-theater in the gallery, that allowed visitors to see a digital version of the entire panorama, in motion, with a voiceover narrator explaining the various scenes. This mini-theater replicated, on a smaller scale, what audiences would have experienced, hearing descriptions and stories while seeing the moving panorama. In terms of subject matter suitable for a moving panorama, an ocean voyage was well-suited to the format of a linear narrative, but it also had to capture the interest of viewers, which meant having a storyline complemented by unusual or exotic scenery, such as volcanoes and uniquely formed islands, and unfamiliar buildings and trees. And at intervals it would need to depict events, in this case the activities associated with whaling and singular events like the volcanic eruption of Pico de Fogo in Cape Verde. It's hard to imagine when you see the size of the whaling panorama that it was completed in just 14 months, Two men collaborated in 1847 to create this epic scene titled Grand Panorama of a Whaling Voyage Round the World. They were Benjamin Russell and Caleb Purrington. Russell was actually a participant in the whaling voyage that was the subject of the panorama. He was a boat steerer employed on board the ship Kutasoff, which had departed from New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1841 and returned in 1844. The voyage lasted 42 months, three and a half years. During that time, Russell made numerous sketches and notes, possibly with the idea of creating a panorama, although it is unknown whether he got the idea before, during, or after the voyage. His prolific visual records of the trip were used a few years after his return to Massachusetts to create the panorama. No notebook has been found, but he must have been rather meticulous in recording what he saw, for the details of the landscapes, seascapes, human and sea life, activities, specific buildings, and the accuracy of the vessels portrayed in the panorama is quite astonishing for something that was painted so quickly. Although it is not known with certainty how the project was accomplished, experts feel it is likely that Russell, a merchant and businessman turned artist, was the one in charge of the project and that he at least did all the drawings of ships and whaling scenes on the cotton sheeting material. He was a proficient marine artist who specialized in ship portraits, whereas Purrington was a sign painter by trade. Purrington's role in the artistic production is not known. He may have sketched in the backgrounds, using Russell's notebooks for reference, and also worked on areas that did not require especially fine draftsmanship. Another scenario could be that Russell did the drawing and Purrington did the painting, which was accomplished using distemper. For those not familiar with distemper, it was a water-soluble paint for indoor use that was made with powdered chalk or lime bound with a vegetable or animal product, something other than egg. It does not hold up well compared to other types of paint, but was inexpensive and so was often used for things like scenery backdrops. Since Russell was still trying to pay off debts from the 1830s, he needed to make this a low-cost project, and his temper suited his purpose. When the work was completed, Russell took to the road with the grand panorama and its display equipment, and served as its narrator. For Adrian, seeing an actual 19th-century panorama 
helped her understand the nature of the product that Barnum was commissioning while he was in Europe. His letters tell us he had approached a man named Mr. Lambert about the project. We do not know if the panorama was the work of two or more individuals, as Russell and Purrington's whaling voyage was, but a passage in one letter suggests that Lambert was the draftsman and another individual, a painter, was to be hired by him. Barnum began his quest to acquire a panorama in mid-August of 1845, when he was in Paris. He wrote to his agent in Paris, Monsieur Houet, to say that he had received a letter from Monsieur's Molteni and Company, the opticians, and that unfortunately their demands are too great for me. By way of explanation, he added in his note, they asked for 10,000 francs for the panoramas, that is to say 8,000 for that of Napoleon and 2,000 for Versailles. This is quite too much. There is already a panorama existing representing the funeral of Napoleon. It was made somewhere in Paris, and perhaps it is now there and may be bought for a low price. I wish you to try to learn where it is and whether it is for sale. Ten days later, on August 28th, he reported to Fortis Hitchcock, manager of the American Museum, that he had found this regarding the panorama, and I send it to you. Exactly what this was, he didn't say, but he went on to describe what he did with it. I cut the figures so as to turn them under while showing the letter to another Frenchman, who talked of making me a similar panorama. My plan now is to try to buy a good one ready-made, if I can do so. The remark suggests he did not want to show the other Frenchman a price he'd been quoted. That Barnum was aiming for a moving panorama, not a static one, is clear in his request to Hitchcock. I wish you once more to send me what is the size of our stage, the height, width, and depth. It is necessary sometimes for me to know that. On September 11th, in the same letter that commented about the worn-out panorama of Napoleon's funeral, Barnum seemed uncertain of his next move. He remarked to his unidentified correspondent, possibly Monsieur Houet, I must abandon the thought of having that panorama, at least for the present. The price asked is quite too high, and it would be nonsense to have Lambert make it for a less price than he already named, for he would produce an inferior article for a less sum, and that would not do for me. So I must give it up. This may have been a ploy to get a better price. As he continued in this letter, I will not submit to being swindled. 4,000 francs ought to produce a magnificent and perfect panorama of the subject which I want, and someday I will find the artist in Paris who will do it. Despite the tone of dissatisfaction, the very same day Barnum wrote to his manager Hitchcock to inform him, I have engaged the panorama of Napoleon's funeral. The same artist is doing it whom Molteni was to employ and for which he was to charge me 8,000 francs. I have engaged it for 6,000 francs, thus saving $400. 2,000 francs being roughly equivalent to $400 at the time. I shall also introduce the funeral of Lafayette, costing perhaps 800 or 1,000 francs more. They are to be done in July. The last statement sets a time frame of over nine months, and one would assume that a depiction of Napoleon's re-internment funeral, grand as it was, would not require as many yards of cotton fabric as the depiction of a three-year voyage. When Barnum wrote to Boston showman Moses Kimball in mid-November, boasting of his commissions of an anatomical Venus and a panorama, he referred to the latter as a moving panorama and diorama representing the funeral of Napoleon. Perhaps the idea of having a diorama was to display it in the museum as an enticement to visitors to pay to see the moving panorama in the lecture hall. As with the dissolving views, also shown in the lecture hall, a narrator would need to be hired to explain the scenes to the audience as the scenery advanced. Such a person would need to be skilled at engaging audiences since the subject of Napoleon's funeral was probably not quite as compelling to Americans as it was to a French audience. But perhaps Barnum had reason to think it would be. In any case, just seeing a moving panorama was novel and entertaining, and certainly would have been an experience to talk about with friends. Perhaps because Barnum's commissioned panorama would not be finished for months to come, plus the additional time for packing and shipping, he decided to contact Hitchcock in late January of 1846 to float the idea of renting a number of panoramas from a man in Scotland. These, he said, he could have sent off to New York right away, along with a narrator. Writing to Hitchcock from Arbroath, Scotland, Barnum described the opportunity as follows. 
A Mr. Marshall of Scotland has some twenty or thirty panoramas of all sorts, moving panoramas. They are good. I send a handbill of two or three. He would send a man to America with six or eight of them if we want for a year. I don't yet know for what price, but suppose about twenty dollars per week, perhaps much more. He is to give me his price in ten days. I'll not engage them till I hear from you. This Mr. Marshall was undoubtedly one of the men in the father-son partnership of Peter and William Marshall. In the 1810s, the two developed perestrephic, or moving panoramas that used very large rollers cranked by hand, Barnum noted. Marshall has got rich in the business. Providing further details on the subjects of the panoramas and the mechanics of showing them, he continued, He has a lot of panoramas. Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon at Elba, St. Helena, etc. Also, the scene of the tournament held in Scotland some years since, the frozen regions, and many others that are lying still. And he said if we could agree upon a price, he would send a man over with them. They are well painted, and are, I think, quite effective. They will fit on stage and can be shown and wound up on a cylinder and put out of the way in no time. About three might be shown in three quarters of an hour. With the recent acquisition of a second museum, Barnum also thought the rented panoramas could be sent to Baltimore for his uncle Allenson Taylor to use. I wish you to think of it, and also send the handbill to Taylor and let him think of it, and then you write me your opinions, he told Hitchcock. He mentioned that he had not told Marshall he had two museums, but if I hire them, I shall use them when and where I please, so that by getting another man or two in America to explain them, we could have them distributed and showing in New York, Baltimore, and perhaps in Boston or Philadelphia at the same time. Barnum seems to have thought Marshall would charge him additional fees for showing the panoramas at other venues, and he clearly did not want to mention the possibility. The potential conflict must have been weighing on his mind and caused him to consider how he might avoid the problem altogether. He even went so far as to suggest that they might copy these panoramas, though whether this would be achieved by getting quick sketches or by depending upon the visual memory of an artist is not clear. The limitations of photography at this time would not have allowed for taking pictures on the sly. In any case, Barnum was racing ahead with this idea of copying panoramas, since he did not yet know if he and Marshall would agree on terms. His determination not to be defeated or outdone seems to have been a driving factor in figuring out how to get them, and get them as cheaply as possible. He confided to Hitchcock, If we had good pictures to copy from, perhaps an artist might be found in America to get them up for us, or I could pick up such an artist here and send him over. But whether that would not be more expensive than to hire these is a question. In fact, I have no idea what Marshall would ask for them. I only know that he has several stored in his place in Edinburgh, and it seems to me that he would sooner have them earn a few pounds per week than to be still, but perhaps not. He has agreed to give me his terms in a few days. Curiously, Marshall's price does not appear in any of Barnum's subsequent letters to Hitchcock, but he did return to the subject of renting Marshall's panoramas six weeks later in a March 18th letter, and again on March 31st. The single sentences do not tell us much, other than that the arrangement was still being considered. Barnum stated, without further explanation, Thank you for your hints about Marshall's panorama. And two weeks later noted, I have written Marshall about the panoramas and shall get his answer in time to write you by the Great Western Steamship. That's probably all we'll learn about this particular endeavor. But there is a bit more to mine from Barnum's letters concerning the panorama he had commissioned in Paris. He wrote to Agent Oué on February 12, 1846, and despite the passage of several months since making the agreement with Lambert, the painting of the panorama does not seem to have been started, though the scenes had been, or were still being, sketched. The language suggests that Mr. Lambert's artistic responsibility was limited to sketching the canvas, but not painting it. Barnum replied to Monsieur Oué, I am glad Monsieur Lambert is getting along so well with the panorama. I hope he will not fail to have a first-rate artist paint the scenes one who understands light and shade, distance, etc. If he finishes it by May or June, it will be quite on time. A week later, Barnum replied to a letter from Messrs. Draper and Company to clarify the financial arrangements he had made with Lambert. Apparently, Lambert had gone to Messrs. Draper looking for an advance on his contract with Barnum. 
while Barnum was flattered and felt much obliged for their kind and voluntary offer to advance the sum on his behalf, he stated in no uncertain terms that his agreement with Lambert did not include advances. Monsieur Lambert knows full well that I totally declined entering into any engagement with him which required me to advance a single sou, and I still decline it. But the moment his work is finished, according to our treaty, that moment the money shall be handed him, and the sooner it is finished, the better I shall like it. Barnum explained that, in principle, he was quite averse to paying in advance, as it gives the person who receives the money an undue and unjust advantage over the person paying it. He was aware, nonetheless, that Lambert would have upfront costs, such as the canvas or cotton cloth and its preparation, but Barnum expected that materials could be gotten on credit. He thus added, Monsieur Lambert holds a writing with my signature, binding me to pay him the 6,000 francs as soon as the work is completed according to contract, and by exhibiting that writing to those from whom he is making purchases, they will give him credit, provided they have confidence in him, and provided also they are assured of my responsibility, which I trust they will be upon consulting you. So what was Barnum paying for this grand panorama? He had told Hitchcock that he shaved 2,000 francs, or $400, off the 800 francs Molteni was going to charge him. That was a $400 discount in the year 1846. So we have to calculate what that amount would mean in today's dollars. Equivalency estimates can only be very approximate when going back prior to 1900, but using a consumer price index inflation calculator, we found that the 6,000 francs, or $1,200, Barnum promised to pay Lambert would be equivalent to about 42500 in today's dollars, a hefty sum. Renting panoramas from Marshall at $20 per week, that was Barnum's guess as to what Marshall might charge, would be roughly 709 in today's dollars, much less expensive than purchasing a panorama. Clearly, commissioning a panorama was a substantial investment in its day, and it was a risky one. Many such endeavors, perhaps the majority, failed to reap the kind of financial reward their owners hoped for. Barnum's resolve not to overpay was a wise one. But of course, in a museum setting, he did not need to rely on the success of any one attraction as Benjamin Russell did with his show. Yet, having only been a museum proprietor for four years, Barnum was still new at the game, though smart enough to realize that the public could be fickle, and success was never guaranteed. Thank you for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. Support for this episode is provided by the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities. The podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum and based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pinna, and narration is by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our COO. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and visit our YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Connect with us on social media and let us know what you think. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures with P.T. Barnum.